our enthusiastic tour guide then surprised everyone with a change of mood as he mentioned the Congo. Now, I'd never heard of the Belgian-Congo relationship, but if that seemingly odd pairing of countries wasn't enough, my intrigue further peaked when he said that although what he was about to say next isn't a nice story, he felt that it was important to tell it. As do I. In 1830, after the Belgian Revolution, the United Kingdom of the Netherlands sees the French and Flemish-speaking Catholic provinces in the south separate from their Dutch-speaking Protestant neighbours in the north, thereby creating Belgium. When Belgium's second ever king, King Leopold II, takes over, he believes the colony will propel his new country to greatness. But with much of the world already part of other European empires, King Leopold orders a five-year exploration of the much unknown Central African region, specifically the Congo. In 1885, the Berlin Conference is held where European leaders agree upon the partition of this massive continent in what is known as the Scramble for Africa. At the meeting, unlike the other leaders who would colonise Africa for their country, Leopold incredibly gains the Congo as a personal asset by pretending to have humanitarian intentions. In the newly named Congo Free State, Leopold in reality creates an army made up of Africans from other countries to enforce slave labour amongst the Congolese villages for the collection of first ivory and then, in more horrific circumstances, rubber. If villages missed their rubber quota, they would be shot to death and their hands severed and brought back to their Belgian superiors as proof that the army was doing their job of enforcement. However, often against orders, the army would go hunting, and so to cover up their missing and costly bullets, the soldiers would cut off the hands of completely innocent people to deceive their Belgian superiors. In effect, hands became a currency in exchange for bullets and unfulfilled rubber quotas which led to some villages attacking other villages for the sole purpose of acquiring chopped off hands so that the victorious village could give the army their neighbours hands rather than their own. When the Leopold administration was questioned as to why so many hands had been cut off, they simply lied and said it was cancer of the hands. Leopold used his fortune from rubber to finance major building work including the Royal Palace and the Cinquantenaire Arch which one rebellious Belgian politician called at the time the Arch of the Severed Hands. With the increased exposure of Leopold's activities in the Congo Free State, he eventually sells his personal asset to the Belgian government, but only after burning the Congo administrative archive, stating, I will give them my Congo, but they have no right to know what I did there. It is estimated that Leopold exploited the Congo for more than $1 billion in today's currency, causing the deaths of 10 million Congolese people. Now, even within all the exploitation of past European colonialism, the story of Belgium's colonial project, limited to only Central Africa, stands out as particularly horrific. But maybe what is even more shocking is that Belgium have done a pretty bad job of acknowledging this period of history. So let's have a look at four examples of silence and lies. Number one. In 1960, when the country now known as the Democratic Republic of the Congo gained independence, the Belgian king patronisingly declared at the ceremony, the independence of the Congo is the crowning of the work conceived by the genius of King Leopold II. He did not come to you as a conqueror, but as an agent of civilization, as the country's newly elected and first ever prime minister listened with incredulity. Patrice Lumumba revised his speech to the shock of the elites in the room but to the cheers of the Congolese people listening to the radio in their homes. We have experienced forced labour in exchange for pay that did not allow us to satisfy our hunger, to clothe ourselves, to have decent lodgings, or to bring up our children as dearly loved ones. Morning, noon and night, we were subjected to jeers, insults and blows because we were Negroes. Who will ever forget that the black was addressed as two, not because he was a friend, but because the polite vu was reserved for the white man. Number two, the Belgian state, simply by inaction, has systematically suppressed the story of the Congo. As one Belgian historian writes, there's an entire generation that wasn't brought up with the Congo. It wasn't mentioned in our history classes. And this concealment continues at the level of state administration. There is still an unwillingness to open the lid on our colonial past. Some of the archives are still very difficult to access something which I find indefensible. It is not until 1998, when the book King Leopold's Ghost is published, 
that the wider public are exposed to the full horrors of the Congo. Number three, just outside Brussels, showing some incredible gold, the Royal Museum of Central Africa, itself a building paid for by the Congo profits, had until 2005 completely ignored the exploitation and suffering of the Congolese people. Indeed, in the remedial efforts felt necessary since the Congo entered public consciousness, the museum closed for renovation in 2013 and currently states on its website, when the museum reopens in June 2018, Belgium's colonial past will be addressed capably and openly. Number four, if the decision or rather non-decision to keep Leopold's statues wasn't bad enough, the rewriting of history from the epitaphs attached to these statues really is a kick in the teeth for the Congolese people. This one reads, I have undertaken the work of the Congo in the interests of civilization, and it is flanked by two sculptures on either side representing the before and after of Leopold's supposed work. The before sculpture shows the Congolese naked, bounded by rope, and in fear of their whip-holding Arab slave master, whilst the after sculpture shows them as clothed, Christian, and composed trade workers, with the person seated on the left even using a microscope. Then there's this Leopold monument, where the sign placed next to the statue of the Congolese people on the left reads, The gratitude of the Congolese to Leopold II for having liberated them from slavery under the Arabs. Indeed, in 2004, an activist group provided some reality to the monument by cutting off the hand of one of the Congolese statues. And it is not the only Leopold statue that has been the focus of protest. These two cover him in symbolic red paint. This one calls him a mass murderer. And this one states assassin, which to further reveal the impact of Leopold's colonialism is connected with the 1961 murder of the Democratic Republic of the Congo's first prime minister, which the Belgian government are strongly accused of being involved. Now, in terms of the extent that the Belgium state should feel shame regarding events that happened over a century ago, which as individuals they had nothing to do with, is not an easy question to answer. However, it is undeniably shameful when there is little or no acknowledgement of such an atrocity. And the reason why all of this is important, and the reason why history, good or bad, but especially the bad, needs to be learnt, is so that the bad doesn't happen again.